funny last name, but nothing nothing came to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My last name is a hilarious name because no one knows how to pronounce it. Hey, did I not hey, say, I don't say it correctly? It now. Did I not say it correctly? What? It's Kimbaya, yeah. My uh, aunt pronounces it Kimbaja. She was like, that's how Colombians pronounce it. I'm like, no one in Colombia pronounces that that way. And I've asked everyone in Colombia. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Well, since I've been on the mic for the past two minutes, spitting out all my secrets, uh, welcome, everyone, to the CyberDev Dojo. Uh, my name is Omar. I am the uh, organizer for the CyberDev Dojo. Uh, you are all sitting in Secure Logics, which is a sponsor of uh, the CyberDev Dojo. You can thank them for the water, the Coke, and the pizza. So let's give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> Specifically, Stephen, way back there, who's actually working on something, so please don't bother him, unless he wants to be bothered, in which case, please bother him. Uh, he drove, ladies and gentlemen, to Sam's Club to pick up that take and bake. <laughs> he drove there. They didn't deliver. What a world we live in, where you have to drive to pick up the pizza that you ordered. First world problems. First world <laughs> problems, my friends, and problems they are. But many thanks to Steven for making that extra effort and for Secure Logics for providing the pizza. Uh, my name is Omar, as I said before, and I work for DevLogix, which is also a sponsor of the CyberDev Dojo, as well as O'Reilly. So if you guys like reading the O'Reilly books, like learning new languages and technologies, they have graciously provided us a discount code, which is PCBW, so you can get 50% off on all your O'Reilly books, uh, ebooks, and 40% off the print books. So if you're in the market to buy some O'Reilly books, please let me know. and. I'll toss that key over to you. You can use it as many times as you want to. Uh, they're more than happy to support us. So I'm very happy for the support of Secure Logics, Def Logics, and O'Reilly. Uh, a really quick announcement before we begin with our presentation. Uh, we have the Security Engagement Series starting next month. And for those of you who are new and don't know about the Security Engagement Series, uh, it is going to be our inaugural event. And it is an event that is geared towards small and medium businesses to educate them on secure topics that affect them on a daily basis. So our first event is going to be about ransomware. And we have Tom Irvin, is that how I pronounce his name correctly? Uh, of the FBI. If you've ever seen one of his presentations before, you know what you're going to get. It's, gonna, it's a really, really great presentation. He's the guy that shows up to any place with a pineapple router that says AT&T Wi-Fi, and he knows everyone who connects to it. He doesn't do anything bad to your phones, as far as you guys know, but he has that ability, and it just it freaks the pants off of everybody. It's a very visceral experience. It's wonderful. It puts a smile on my face. And he's going to do it with ransomware. So he will be putting ransomware on everyone's smartphones. So please come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just kidding. He's not going to do that. But he will be tailoring that presentation that he does with the pineapple router and whatnot to ransomware. So it's going to be a very visceral experience. It'll be a very interesting talk. And right afterwards, we're going to have a panel discussion with uh, David Newman, uh, Gordon McKay, uh, Jeff as well, and potentially a fourth person uh, to talk about more about ransomware, best practices, what to do, uh, and it should be a really great talk. So that's going to be on October 18th at the Geekdom Event Center. And since we're having the Security Engagement Series next month, the next dojo will happen at the Security Engagement Series. So there will not be a second Wednesday meetup it will be on October 18th, that Tuesday, which also means it's Downtown Tuesday, which means you guys get to park downtown for free in any public parking lot. So we, we keep you guys in mind because everyone hates to pay for parking, especially in San Antonio. Uh, who here loves to pay for parking? You don't have to pay for parking after 6 o'clock. So this guy's smart. <laughs> but if you park in the parking garages, you still have to pay. Well, yeah, but just don't park for parking. All public parking. If you can't hear that on the live stream, he's being a smart ass. And that's a good thing, because we <laughs> encourage that at the CyberDev Dojo. So remember, mark your calendars, October 18th, 6.30, no, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, which means you have to park before free parking. You have to park before <laughs> free parking. But free yeah, parking is. how can they register for this? So we have an Eventbrite that I will send out on our meetup page after this meetup. 
and you will be able to register there. How many of you have already registered for the Security Engagement Series? Good. The rest of you didn't raise your hands. Please, 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 you are all invited. Uh, it's a free event. There will be drinks. There will be uh, light refreshments. And it will be a very good talk and a very great experience. Drinks like water and Coke. Yeah, not hard drinks that Grayson likes to indulge on a daily basis. He really has a problem, guys. This is this this is not a me. This is intervention for Grayson. So let's let's all give him support. Grayson, thanks for being here. All right, let's get started with today's talk: the Internet uh, Insecurity of Things with uh, Jeff Reich. He did speak earlier today at the SAIT symposium about this particular topic as well, and I. I think only one person here went to that symposium, which is understandable. I was there. Well, obviously. And I'm not really pointing at myself. Okay, three people in this room were at the symposium. Uh, it was a really interesting event, uh, expensive to go to, but it was interesting. And they did give us a free breakfast, lunch, and open bar at the end of it. So if I am rambling a lot, it's because I had a bit too many. I didn't have any. But. Thank you all for being here. Let's get started with the talk, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. And, and since Omar gave me a hard time about not pronouncing his name correctly, which I actually did, I'm going to give him a hard time about not pronouncing my name correctly, because the last name is actually pronounced Rich. And the easy way to remember this is the E is silent. It's the only part of me that is. And you'll always remember how to pronounce my name that way. Now, for those of you in here, and thank you, uh, there, there's two things you get. First of all, if you're here in person in the room, you have the benefit of being in person here in the room, and you get to see this presentation with a much nicer font. What's being live streamed, and I'm really sorry, and I'm going to talk to the camera. There are people that are watching this um, in live stream. You're seeing the same presentation, same content, but a slightly different font. Next time you need to come to the meeting if you want the better font. And right? pizza. And pizza. Yeah. Uh, apparently, really good pizza. Right, another round for the pizza. <laughs> so, this presentation, as, as Omar said, I did deliver today, and I was really kind of surprised with some of the reactions, one in particular, and no, no spoiler, all right? Uh, I'm gonna definitely want interaction. I've spoken here once before, and I really appreciate being, having the opportunity to do it again. Uh, if you remember last time, I really did draw on interactive participation, meaning that if you don't ask me a question, there's a really good chance I'm going to ask you a question. And uh, we have Chris here who is um, diligently watching inbound questions coming in. I'm going to give you a hard time because his name is Casey. 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 <laughs> we have Casey here. Well, like Chris, Casey, they're similar. No, that's Chris. Okay. This is Casey. That's Grayson. That's David. And you're Omar. I'm Jeff. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Casey. Jeff right? Reich. Casey. <laughs> so Casey. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is diligently, still diligently, regardless of his name, he's diligently <laughs> watching for inbound questions from anyone watching on live stream, and we will address those as well. I do want to have questions for two reasons. One, you don't want to hear me talk for 45 minutes. And after I've already done it once today, i actually not certain I have 45 minutes left in the throat. Uh, but also, I want to make sure we tailor this a bit to not only what you might need, but I know some of you, and I've talked to a couple already, that have some IoT experience that I think if you share, other people can benefit from as well. All right, so off we go. Here's the abstract. There's really no point in me reading this to you. It's up there. It, it really is the reason I did the presentation. It's that the IoT is all around everywhere. And I've actually met some people today who said, I have nothing to do with the IoT. And I just smiled and I said, actually, you probably do. You just don't recognize it yet. And we're going to talk about what some of those opportunities are. Um, by the way, what's the easiest way to find out if someone that says, I don't have anything on IoT, and say, yeah, I actually probably do? What, what would you think would be the first guess you have that you think might not be? Phone is certainly one of them, and just about everyone has one of those. Right, another example, Fitbit. Now, you know that is, definitely. If someone has a Fitbit, they pretty much know they're on the Internet of Things, one would think. What sort of device do you think exists, or thing that exists, that is on the it is part of the internet thing, but a lot of people don't think of it that way. A pacemaker. A pacemaker. Actually, yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good answer. Not the one I had in mind, but it's a very good answer. Oh, a car. A car. Thank you, Mike. And that is the one I was looking for. Yeah. Meaning that your life is in the hands of any hacker that can get access to your car. 
that now it's not quite that bad, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. But if you look at your car, your refrigerator, um, and later on I'm going to ask another question about some other unusual items, uh, unusual things that are on the internet or things. We'll see what we can come up with. I'm going to put this up here only because it's in my presentation. This, is, by the way, is what's known as two-factor authentication. I'm saying my name is Jeff Rich. This picture proves it, as you can see. <laughs> All right? So that's two-factor authentication. I am who I say I am. I've been doing this a very long time, which is why that paragraph is there. We don't need to look at the rest of that. I am the Chief Security Officer for Barricade Security Systems, also President of Barricade, Inc. And I'm saying all this, and actually all of you have the honor of seeing the last presentation I make as a member of Barricade. And I'm not leaving Barricade. Barricade is in the process of being acquired. Um, that should, thank you, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you again. Uh, to start clapping. Yes, it is. I, I will save my applause for after it's signed. But, but it is, <laughs> we are very close to having that happen. Um, at which point the offering we have will actually be shut down and at some point very likely integrated into what the new, it is in the same space the security company is going to be offering. And that's all I can say about that for now, but there's more news to come on that. So this is very likely the last actual true barricade presentation, and you can say you were here for it, which I, I it, it's important to me anyways. Th these are our offices. Um, I am, you are looking at the U.S. office right now, not that me. Um, over here on, on the screen, though, that's our office, our headquarters in Cork, Ireland. And I sometimes ask for geek credentials. I know I'm not going to ask for it here, but I am going to ask not to have someone say what is unique in that room besides the people, which are good and unique and everything else. Can someone, does anyone not know what that is? And for those um, live streaming, I'm looking at, I'm pointing to the blue box on the right hand picture. And anyone ready to admit? Anyone ready to admit that they don't know what that is? It's fine. We won't embarrass you too much. Everyone knows that it's a TARDIS, right? Okay. That that's not only the but it's one of the cool things we have about working at at Barricade. We have our own TARDIS, um, and actually we have communication between the U.S. and Ireland. We're still working on the whole time thing, but it's a it's a prototype. So um, it's something that we're very proud of having there in our office. So what is the Internet of Things? There's a lot of definitions out there. They're probably all right. Whoops. There we go. S stay with me. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of definitions out there. The one that I use, and this is no particular source other than me, it's, and I do look at it as an emerging evolution of the Internet that has a whole bunch of common objects, very, you know, what we typically consider common objects, and to me, here's the key about the Internet of Things. Not only are they addressable, but they have the capability to collect, store, and transmit data. And most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be somewhat centered around that, more so than how many goofy things can we put on the Internet. Because w when you get down to it, if you can put a chip into it and a transmitter of some sort, you can have something in the IoT. The big question is, what does it capture? What does it store? What does it transmit? And where? So we're going to talk about that a bit. Uh, I'm going to list a few things. Remember I said there's going to be a question. I was going to have a, a question coming up. So this is the first real official question coming up. Can someone give me an example of what's in the Internet of Things? Put it out. We already heard car, and we heard Fitbit, which I'll talk about in a minute. Security systems. Security systems, okay. You mean like video camera? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yep, that very much. Autopilots. Airplane navigation. Airplane navigation autopilots are in the Internet of Things. Actually, you're right. I haven't heard that one before, but you're absolutely right. Watch along. Oh, the key, there are a lot of, uh, by the way, if you haven't heard, I'm going to reference something later. Um, uh, there are a lot of electronic locks that you could unlock with your phone. Uh, I don't know, how, did anyone here go to DEF CON last month? Okay, so every year at DEF CON they talk about here's all the things that you're comfortable using that you should really be thinking a little bit more about. There is, a co in computer world, which is actually still relevant, and I'm not saying that in a bad way. Sometimes I'm surprised that computer world is still relevant. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember it was the big long paper that you would get once a month, once a week rather, and read through. I'm old, I'm sorry. Um, but c if you look at computer world, it was published online yesterday, it was the 13th, right? So it was published online yesterday, and 
it listed all the things that were hacked um, on DEF CON and virtually all of the Slage and Quickset and all those other locks that you can do remotely, all of them were hacked. Once again, I'm not saying don't use them. Be aware of your situation, right? There is a long list, and if we have time, I'll bring up the article. I, I have it in here, but there is a lot out there that is on the Internet of Things, and once it's there, you know, you have to assume how well vetted the code and everything is, and, and by the way, assume it's not at all. You're usually going to be pretty safe. A couple other examples. So I, I put up a couple things here already. Um, computers, all different types, mainframes, PCs, storage devices, video cameras, which I heard was some. A uh, couple other examples. You know there's some out there. Most of our new TVs are appliances. New TVs, yes. Yeah, new TVs are there. And appliances. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take appliances as refrigerators within the appliances scheme, right? So uh, why would a refrigerator be on the internet of things? Yeah, inventory control. Uh, and may not be the term you want to apply to it at home, but you can set it up so that you can put an RFID chip or something on a carton of milk, and after it's taken out four times, it knows that you could either notify you that you need to go buy milk, or you can have a direct interface to online grocery delivery and have milk and whatever else delivered, and we, with no interaction needed from you. Yeah, you can also see what's inside your refrigerator while you're not there. I, I would question why anyone would really want to do that, but you can. You're right. <laughs> and um, and so you know, a, a lot of things, a lot of reasons to be there. And I'm not trying to say these are bad reasons. I, I like doing this. I really like being able to leverage technology over everyday use. We just need to be aware of what it is. I'm not sure anyone really needs to know how much milk I drink. Which, by the way, can anyone tell me how much milk I drink in a week? I'm serious. It's a serious question. Can anyone tell me how much milk I drink in a week? Two yeah. gallons. None. I'm a vegan. All right. So uh, that's out there, right? But I'm not any better off for it. I'm just a vegan. I'm not saying better than you. Hot, my, our hot water heaters are our internet of things. So here's one. Now, how would I feel? And I like being able to program and remotely control my hot water heaters. But how would I feel if someone just decided to just turn that up? Mm, I probably wouldn't like it very much. That's something I probably want to control pretty well. Uh, by air conditioning, yes. How about utilities? The long stuff now, double back and forth line, yep. you know, there's fanning. I don't know if there's yep. there or not. U utilities are definitely on the Internet of Things. Yeah, utilities are already there on the Yes. Uh, but you can do override control. Okay. You program it, you can override it. Um, it's same thing with the heating and air conditioning. Especially if you sign up for, for the CPS um, Smart, I think it's the Smart Home Project. I, I may not have the name accurate for that. I apologize. Uh, and you, they'll install thermostats for you. They'll install smart thermostats for you that are both programmable and you can control remotely. And so can they. Meaning that whenever there's a, a peak load on the electric grid, they can, in the summer, raise the temperature of your, of your house two degrees or four degrees. And in the winter, go down the same way. Three degrees, thank you. Do you work for CPS? Yeah, I work for concert, I think. Oh, okay, you work for concert, yes, okay. Who, and, and whenever you do anything for CPS, you see the concert logo in the bottom of the screen, yes. All right, thank you. So, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm in the ballpark. I'm accurate, you're precise. Okay, so <laughs> um, So, I'm not accusing concert of doing anything that you wouldn't want done, which I'm sure isn't happening, or CPS, but what level of assurance do you have, and I'm not asking you to justify that, but what level of assurance do you have that that is being controlled correctly and access to the concert systems is controlled in the right way that someone that I wouldn't want there isn't getting to it? I don't know. And you think, really, how much damage could you do to your house? Let's say you're gone for a week in January, which is, if it's gonna freeze here, that may be the month that it freezes, all right? And someone who had remote control turned the temperature of your house down to, a, full air conditioning, you would run the risk of your outside pipes freezing and breaking and causing a whole bunch of damage to your house. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that's a scenario you should worry about, but what I am saying is each one of these opportunities gives you a doorway to a situation like that that you need to at least think about, all right? So what else do we have in the Internet of Things? Alarm systems, let's come back to security systems. Yeah, my home alarm system is on the Internet of Things. And I mentioned video cameras before. 
Boy, here's something. Um, how many people have a, a monitoring video camera somewhere in their house? Okay, the rest of you just aren't going to admit it. I get that, but okay. So, a, a couple of things. First of all, that I if you use the same wireless router, for instance, that you use for your phone and your tablet and everything else to get to the internet, you're intermingling those streams, which may or may not be encrypted, by the way, and how do you know if that stream is encrypted? This isn't a technical quiz, it's just a question. Oh yeah, you gotta sniff it. Thank you very much. That, that could work, and if, although you have to be able to sniff and know that it's actually a video stream rather than just some sort of garbage, which a video stream might look like if you're looking at a straight network super. You could also consider asking whoever your supplier is and say, can you validate what if you're encrypting this, and if so, how? So we're talking about having a level of trust that exists with your supplier mm -hmm. that you may need to confirm. And so I would recommend having all of your video encrypted, period. I, I wouldn't put a qualifier on it. Encrypt all your video. The second thing mm -hmm. is the service that comes with a lot of these allows you to subscribe to cloud storage, which is really convenient because you can store it in the cloud. You don't have to have a hard drive locally. And whenever you need to, re to look at anything when something happened, um, you can recall it and take a look at it. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I'm not saying it's a great idea, but I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I don't do it. And the reason I don't do it is that I don't want anyone else to have control of images of what's going on in my house, because I know what I do in my house, and I don't really want anyone else to know what that <laughs> is. All right? And you can appreciate that, I'm sure. So consider, is it encrypted, and is it being stored in the cloud? And if it is, consider finding another way with that vendor or with that camera to store it locally for yourself, which, which is what I do. So uh, we talked, I, I just mentioned, you know, intermingling with mobile phones and tablets. Those are definitely, as you mentioned uh, right at the beginning, they are definitely parts of the Internet of Things. If you're intermingling that with some of your IoT stuff, then if you do banking on your phone, those are all going to cross the same channel. Something to keep in mind. I'm not saying, boy, here's a foolproof way to fix it. Although, if you really want to be paranoid, you can't, and I know there's some people in this room that are doing this already, have separate channels, separate routers, and have everything encrypted that's not Internet of Things, like banking or whatever else, you know, whatever websites you're going to visit, or anything else, and keep the IoT, you know, assume it's a corrupt network and knowing that nothing safe is going to be there, although that's not a really safe, comfortable place to be. Printers. I bet there's a printer somewhere in here that is on the Internet of Things. And if it's not a printer, certainly a copier printer will be there, which is um, the next thing that you're going to see listed here. Cop copiers and printers, every time it either prints a page or scans a page, and this includes fax machine, although if you're talking IoT, you're probably not talking fax machine. They, they're starting to become somewhat mutually exclusive, which is a good thing. Every page that's scanned or document that's sent to it is it's processed efficiently because it's put onto the hard drive, oops, and then either sent or copied or made images are made of it. What happens to it on the hard drive after that? Stays on it. It just stays uh, potentially forever, or if it's overwritten, or if you walk by with a real big magnet or something. Yeah, but until then, it stays there on the hard drive. So there's two things to consider. First of all, even before the Internet of Things issues, whoever gets your, if you're leasing your copy or printer, whoever gets it next could potentially have access to everything that's on the hard drive. So think about what's on there. So if you have someone, if you lease it or if you have someone service it for you, you should have them validate for you that they wipe the hard drive before it even leaves your premises. Um, in the same vein, if the printer or copier is accessible from the internet, then the hard drive is accessible from the internet. So even before they come to service, before they wipe the hard drive, it may be out there. Um, I'm giving some examples, and I'm looking to look for more. I, I, it, I feel like I'm getting into a 20 minutes after pizza slowdown here. Maybe it's just me, you know? Yeah, apparently it is just me, because no one has said anything. So. Uh, don't make everyone stand up and do jumping jacks or something, because I've been known to do that. All right, someone earlier mentioned cars, all right? Many, many cars, in fact, some of you may not be aware your car is on the internet. How many people have, and this happens more in pickups, how many people here have a vehicle that is a Wi-Fi hotspot? 
Do you have two vehicles, or are you just raising your hand? Okay, all right, good. That, so no one else has a Wi-Fi hotspot in their vehicle yet. You will soon, because it eventually will be available on all cars. By definition, that's now, your car is now an IoT device. Mm -hmm. It's ad addressable, and it can collect, transmit, and store data. Now, even if you don't have a Wi-Fi hotspot with your car, if you have a GPS system or a satellite radio, there's a really good chance your car is addressable because in many cases, they're going to do an over-the-air download to upgrade software or firmware for that car. It doesn't always happen, but it does happen often. If that can happen, you, your vehicle is a member of, is in the community of the Internet of Things. So the dangerous part of that is you don't really know what that is. In addition to this, let's add on to everything else, cars, now I'm going to get back to I'm old again. I'm looking around, I may be the oldest person in the room. And you know what's really sad? More and more in every room I go into, I say that. It's just, and, and I guess it doesn't go away. But, um, you know, in the old days, a, a car was simply a whole bunch of mechanical stuff. And that was it. It was simple physics and mechanics, and that's how it worked. Now, and I'm not complaining about it, but now the majority of cars are driven by printed circuit boards and many circuit boards for each individual function that's going to occur, including transmission, brakes, steering, acceleration, everything around that, all right? That's controlled by a central processor, which when you bring your car in for diagnostics, they plug into that and they can see everything that's happened, anything that's wrong, any error codes that have come up. Now that would require, in many cases, a physical plug, but more and more cars now are saying rather than have to plug in under the dash, or under the hood, you just come in and with near field Bluetooth, we can get all the data from your car. Well, guess what? If the mechanic can do it, someone else can as well. So there is a, ca a case, and I think I'm going to, I I'm going to leave this list with things. There's certainly a whole bunch of other things end up on the Internet of Things, which is hence the name, right? Uh, you're getting the idea. The list is not real short. So raise your hands if you have or have had one of these. If you don't recognize it, you haven't. But yeah, most people recognize it, all right? So it, it's a Fitbit for anyone minor. This is, so what can you tell me about this Fitbit? It, it, it can tell time. That's uh, personal medical Personal awareness, jogging. Yeah, yeah. whoever's doing high. this either yeah. needs to go to a hospital or is exercising, yeah. all right? Because their pulse is 135, all right? So that's not a usual good resting pulse. So chances are they're exercising or they're in an ambulance. It'll track your sleep too. Pardon? It'll track your sleep too. Yes, it'll track your sleep. It'll track a number of things. So everyone that raise your hand if you had a, a Fitbit, put your hand up again, please. And then keep your hand up if you know what this is. Whoops. If you know what, come on, what that is. Okay, you think it's source code. Who said terms of service? Who said terms of service? You? No. Yeah, the winner right there. That is the terms of service to which you agreed when you signed up for it. Now, to their credit, they put this on their website when you sign up in like 10 or 12 point font. You can actually read it. But my goal was to get it on one slide, and in order to do that, I had to make it this size, which kind of gives you an idea of how much information is in the terms of service, which I guarantee every single one of you click through put in your email address or your ID, your account is done, right? Uh, fine, you, don't be ashamed, everyone has done it, right? Go ahead, I dare anyone to stand up and say, no, I read the whole thing. I read the whole thing. You're a liar. <laughs> 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 you are right. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I will admit, I did read the whole thing, and it is tough, I mean, uh, coffee, whatever, it, it's tough to get through, the, I read it with a larger font. And the word privacy shows up four or five times in there, which means privacy is probably pretty important, right? So you want to figure out what they're doing about privacy? If you want to know what they're doing with about privacy, you have to click another link which, show, which brings you to their privacy policy, which then tells you here's what we will or will not do with your data that we collect about your sleeping habits and exercise and your pulse rate and a whole bunch of other things that, like your insurance company would love to have. Now. It, if it doesn't claim that they're going to either sell or give that to the insurance company, but insurance, I bet your health insurance company would love to see that data, right? So you agree to all this, 
you are all potentially negative enablers for the Internet of Things if, if you click through that. And if you, have a, if you have an iPhone or an Android and you ever download an app, you did the same thing. So you're not evil for doing it, and I'm not saying, boy, I need to start reading this whole thing because you'll never get anything done. But be aware when you can, especially things that you think are going to have sensitive information about you, consider taking a look at it. At the very least, read the privacy policy and see what it is. The Fitbit is a, a good above board company, but see what it is that the organization is going to do with your data. Because if they say in a privacy policy that once a month we will sell your data to the highest bidder and you click accept but you hadn't read it, you just agree to have them sell your information to the highest bidder. That's what a privacy policy is. It's not a guarantee that it's keeping private. It just says, here's what we do with it. So privacy policies at a minimum are, are worth reading. Um, I, I talked a bit earlier about video cameras and how we're gonna, how you manage that. I, I like doing attribution and I have to apologize. I thought, this is from a Samsung website and I thought that they had their copyright on it and they didn't. So I'm not trying to usurp their, their information or their video. This came from, this came from Samsung. This talks about two different ways that you can uh, manage the video from your camera in your house. My wife just got home. Okay, two different ways you can manage video from your house. You can go to a third party media server, which is usually gonna be in the cloud. That's what I talked about before. And you can, once you have an account on that, look at it and, you know, is it encrypted? How strong is the authentication? A whole bunch of reasons why you might want to consider looking into it much more before you just say, yes, I want to have the monthly subscription where I keep all my video on the cloud. It could be very good, but you need to check it out first. On the right-hand side, this talks about using the cloud for doing one-time verification, which allows your video camera to send video directly to your phone. So given an option, if they both cost the same, which one would you do? Two. Why? I heard two over here. Secure. You, well, what yeah, you, you have a little bit more control. It's very likely more secure, assuming you have a good connection from the camera to your, to your phone, which may be in the clear, too. You'd obviously have to look into that. But it does give you more control over it rather than putting it entirely in the hands of someone else. If, you're, if you have video cameras and you have the capability of choosing like this, consider local storage that can send it to your phone rather than always put it in the cloud if you had to choose only because there's a certain amount of control you're giving up. Just because you like the Internet of Things, which I do, doesn't mean you have to just completely surrender to it. All right? So now some people are old enough to remember this. And for those of you that are not in Texas watching the live stream, this may not mean much to you. Does this mean anything to anyone here in the room? No? Texas washes, washes the road? Oh, watches the road. Oh, uh, okay. Now you're reading a little bit too much nefarious into what I think I'm trying to go with here. No one here remembers that that was the TxDOT motto, and it was, they, were on, they were on signs on every single highway, and when those, you know, bridge may ice over signs or pulled it down, and we used to say drive friendly on it, it, it kind of disappoints me that it doesn't say that anymore because no one drives friendly anymore, I guess. They're still there. Or, they're still there? Yeah, coming in off of, uh, coming in from Louisiana or I-10. Okay, at, at exit 888, yes. <laughs> um, but you don't see, when's the last time you saw one here? Only because I, the blank stares that I got here kind of told me that. Or maybe you're watching, you're looking at your phone while you're driving and not paying attention to the signs. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, we saw on, on the drive from downtown up to here, I saw three different people. One who had a somewhat of an effect on us on their phone up here. I, yeah. Well, they were trying to, yes, they, they were trying to drive. Uh, they, they were doing something on their phone. I don't know what it was, and I don't really care. I, uh, well, I wasn't paying that close attention. It was pretty close. Pokemon Go. Yes, Pokemon <laughs> Go, exactly. <laughs> so the, the reason I brought this one up here, we talked about cars. Does anyone recognize this image? I didn't make it up. I just I lifted it right from their site. No? So this came, this is the demonstration that came, this came from DEF CON last year. Very good, thank you. Chris, right? See, uh, and you're, oh, I forgot your name. Spacey. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you. 
So, um, yeah, this is from DEF CON last year. This was a demonstration uh, two years before the same group um, plugged a computer into, I think it was a Ford, it was one of the small Fords, and was able to override all of the internal controls and, and turn off braking and steering for a couple seconds while the computer was connected, while they were sitting in the front. The good news about doing it that way, since they really didn't intend to be, you know, suicide um, hackers, that as long as they were in the car, they probably weren't going to let something really bad happen to it. Well, now they can do it without being in the car. And the Chrysler products, unfortunately for them, have picked up quite a reputation for being very vulnerable to this. Um, and the Jeep is a Chrysler product. So that's a Jeep Grand Cherokee over there uh, in the ditch. And um, that, was, that car was essentially disabled with significant braking, steering, and transmission turned off remotely. Now, it's still, a, it's conditions they created. They can't just go out there with a laptop and just, oh, there's a Jeep, and just make it work yet. But they will, the only way they're going to get to be able to do that, and these guys won't be the ones doing it, but the, but the path has been started. The only way to, to get to that point where you can actually target a car and, and remotely do it is to start in a control situation like this. There's more of this to come just because you don't drive a Jeep. And if you dr do drive a Jeep, you can ask Chrysler about this, and and I would love to see if any of you get a straight answer from them on it. <laughs> but uh, just because you don't drive a Jeep doesn't mean your car is immune to this. Now, if you drive a 78 Ford LTD, you're probably safe, all right? But if your car is relatively new, there's a chance that this could happen as well. And um, what I would recommend, especially if you're going to consider buying a new car, if you want to start at the top, you can Google, you know, let's say you wanted to buy a Chevy Impala, just pick any one. You could Google Chevy Impala hacks and see if anything shows up. For those of you that um, are familiar with the space, if you look at the dark web for Chevy Impala hacks, you're probably going to find a little more information. Anyone not know what the dark web is when I talk about it? No. Okay. So everyone else knows what the dark web is, and you're all in it, right? No, 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 no. Oh, they're like, oh, I know what it is, but I, I don't do it. I, I, I watch a friend do it. Yeah. Um, dark web isn't necessarily evil, by the way. It is, <laughs> it is very anonymous, and that's the intent. Using mainly Tor servers that allow you to, through different hops, anonymize your location and your source and everything else, and then get to a place um, where you can get some information that might not be available from Google, for instance. That's some of the good things about using the dark web. The dark web is also used for um, for malware ho ho malware wholesalers. If you wanted to buy a really good piece of malware, I'm not recommending you do that. But if you wanted to buy a really good piece of malware, the dark web is what you, where you do it. You're going to need bitcoins to buy it because it's the only the only currency you're going to accept. You can buy never used, brand new, out of the box malware for bitcoins and have a zero day that you, you want to implement somewhere. Once again, this is neither a recommendation nor an endorsement of doing that, but the fact is you can do it. And the reason that it's still working that way is that the dark web using Tor servers makes you virtually anonymous. The other downside of the dark web is um, there's been a lot of evidence re recently that, I, that I've seen that countries like um, Russia, China, and Iran are trying to get more control over some of the Tor servers, which by definition should never happen, but that doesn't mean it can't. So once that happens, not only is all this going on, but now some of our potential adversarial countries are going to have access to information that we or may or may not have access to. So, and this all still goes back to the Internet of Things, in, in my opinion. So I, I would say if you're going to buy a car at the very least, Google it, what hacks are out there. Not if, but what hacks are out there. And be aware, manage your risk. There may be some features you, you're willing to turn off until you get a good patch for it. Now, um, the 451 Research Group, which advertised itself sometimes as the 451 Alliance, did a report in April of this year. I did put attribution in this one in there. And these are the, they, they surveyed a lot of their users and customers and wanted to come up with what are the main inhibitors for using the Internet of Things. Can you see this back there? And the number one inhibitor, of course, is security concerns. A and that, I think, is simply a result of, yeah, I'm really scared, so security concerns are a really big deal for me. 
Number two, and that's almost half of the user, half of the people surveyed, a lack of internal skill sets. You know, I don't have people that can build the internet of things. Um, actually, all they have to do is come here, right? Mm -hmm. we, we could do that for them. A uh, lack of IT capacity, and well, that's just poor planning on your part. Um, lack of prestige, return on investment your benefits. Why would I want to use something new when what I have already works, right? Uh, by the way, if I were to take this chart and go back in time nine years and put cloud computing instead of IoT, the chart would have been exactly the same for a lot of the same reasons. And I'm gonna get into how cloud fits into this in just a minute. Lack of benefits, organizational resistance. That's the, nah, 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 we don't do that. And I'm gonna feel threatened if we do that, so I'm not gonna get it done. I'm sorry for the live streamers. I just completely trashed your ears. Did I do the same to you, Casey? It's no. delayed. Oh, it's okay. Delayed. I haven't heard it yet. So here it comes, it's ready, three, two, one, bam. All right, um, technology is too immature. All right, that's saying I'm not quite ready for yet. It's not mature enough for me yet. Regulatory concerns. I, actually, I'm completely amazed that anyone said, I'm not gonna go to the internet thing because of regulatory concerns. I am not aware of one bit of regulation with the exception of a couple of states and in a specialized case that say, here's why you shouldn't do the internet of things. So they just made that answer up. Um, compliance concern, yes. It covers the internet of things, or since it's out of scope of the regulations, you can't touch it. Which one is it? Both. Okay. Like we have regulations now that cover uh, BYOB stuff, your, your mm -hmm. uh, phones, your laptops. You know, that stuff's accepted, but yet other stuff is that you're not going to hook your phone up to the internet of things. Or, I mean, your watches. You okay. Know, if your watch is hooked up to your phone, you have to say, you know, there's all sorts of. Okay, so there are DOD regulations that say there's only and certain. Certain conditions that can exist, and I'm sure they have a really good method of detecting all that and blocking everything that, that doesn't meet the regulations, right? Yeah. Um, okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So let's continue down here because there's compliance concerns. By the way, that one could be valid. Um, the Fitbit was an example of that. If someone's collecting health data on you, yeah, you know, actually HIPAA law does cover that. If they're collecting it, HIPAA law, they end up becoming a covered entity. Um, so there could be one there. Lack of budget. They just couldn't come up with a better reason. And then even the people that weren't even that imaginative had to put in on it. All right? I believe I have my own number one reason for why the number one inhibitor for the Internet of Things, in what's a terrible impersonation of David Letterman, I guess. The biggest question that's asked is, what the heck is it? Most organizations don't really know what the Internet of Things means or how to make it work. And when you mention Raspberry Pi to them, they say, oh, lunch. Um, it, it, which, by the way, has a lot to do. It, well, they do. We heard that today. Um, so think about the perspective. Most people don't know what it is, but a lot of people are unwittingly with blindfolds running full force into it because those are the people with the Apple Watches and the Fitbits and the smart cars, that the smart cars, not the smart cars, um, and the smart city planners. Now, I'm not going to take any political or judgmental position on the smart city plan for San Antonio that was just announced, what was it, two, three days ago? That, that, that was published? No one's gonna help me on this, not even someone from concert? No. <laughs> the smart city plan that came out for San Antonio, I just saw it, like within the past week it was published. Uh, no, n well, yeah, that's part of the whole smart city program. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing, and we need to be able to do things like that. And we're not gonna progress forward if we don't take a look at some managed risks and, and, and do that and follow it. But in many cases, we're running blind thinking this is really cool technology and if there's a problem, we'll find out what it is and deal with it later. And I'm probably a bit too paranoid to always feel comfortable doing that. So as it says up here, this is a non-scientific non study according to me. Um, and that's full attribution for that. So what makes the IoT work? Can someone give me one word answer? And if you can't come up with it, I'll tell you how many letters are in it, but I think you can. Trust. Trust makes trust makes the IoT work. All right, so fine. I'm not going to dispute that, but I'll also say trust is so broad that trust makes everything work, including this meeting. Including All right. right. All right. So I'm going to say it's not quite specific enough. You don't get a buzzer, but you don't get a bell. Greed. Greed? Is, it, is that what I heard? Okay. Greed. Well, it, greed. If it's business, then I'm not Gordon Gecko either. But uh, 
information in the business and, and that's and you either you either make money or someone else does. You know, that's what business is. Okay. Give me one word answer. Five letters. Wow. Thank you. Who said that? The, the picture of it on the screen. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> yeah, cloud. Oh well. So there's the answer. Thank you very much. That is a cloud. I'll give you credit. You recognize what it was. It's not a marshmallow. The, the cloud. The, the cloud, and this is a facsimile representation of a cloud. It's not a true cloud. Although this presentation is in the cloud, and now we're getting metaphysical, and I'm not going to do that. So it, the reason the cloud makes it so easy is the cloud is a low barrier of entry. It's super easy to use, and it's direct expense. So what are the two things you need? to be a cloud user, uh, to, to participate in the cloud, not to simply be a cloud recipient like I'm an iPhone. Credit card and a pulse? Credit card and? A pulse. A credit card and a pulse. I'll take an identity as a pulse. An identity, which usually gets interpreted as an email address, and a credit card. You have those two things, you're on the cloud. <coughs> That's all it takes, nothing else. So let's come up with an example of a company, let's say a financial institution. This is completely hypothetical. I'm not pointing to anyone financial institution, they, they've actually gone to the cloud in some areas, but everything they do is correctly controlled. They are, they're under FFIC examinations twice a year, and everything is going right. They use, they, had, they use the CAT. If you're not in financial services, you have no idea what that is. That's fine. It's, a really, it's actually a pretty good tool, but it's a really long list of things you need to do um, with computing. All the right things are happening, and the marketing department says, we want to have a new promotion for this new credit card that we're going to be offering. So we want to put out something next week that says, come look at the new service we have with your credit card, and you're getting extra points, and you can take trips to the Bahamas every time you charge something, and whatever else it's going to say, right? And they could either go to the IT department. I apologize to any IT person that works for the financial institution in here. They can go to the IT department and say, here's what I want to do, and the IT department says, okay, give me your give me your requirements, let me take a look at it, I'll come up with the specs, we'll go provision some service for you, we'll come back to you in about three weeks, we can start coding after that. And, and marketing says, no, 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 the promotion's going to be over in four weeks. We can't wait three weeks to start. I need this Tuesday. So what they can do instead is find a, find a DevOps person that says, just stand up an AWS instance for me, and I can write it for you in a couple of hours. They have an idea, a Pulse and a credit card. They now have their AWS instance that can be stood up, and presto, there, there's the promotion for it, and there may even be a mobile app for it. All right? That's now on the Internet of Things. It's cloud. I'm, I'm, I'm diverging a bit into the cloud here. So the promotion goes great, and there's a lot of uptake, and people are getting a new credit card, and everything's wonderful. And the marketing department says, we did a great job with that. And then they move on to their next project. So now what happens? Yes? Yeah, you, you have an open hole, which can often turn into a zombie server. And the IT department never really knew about it, because the chief marketing officer, although if they have a CE, you'd like to think they weren't there, but maybe they were. The person in charge of the marketing promotion put it on their credit card, and they get billed for it, and then they submit an expense report, and accounting may or may not, finance department may or may not look at all of those expenses to see are, there, are they really IT expenses, or is this an, ex an expense that's just within this budget, so don't worry about it, let it happen. Which, by the way, is kind of the default, unfortunately. So now, the person in charge of this said, oh, I got this charge, and I guess we're still doing stuff there. So they let the charge go on for a couple of months. Meanwhile, the system isn't patched. It's not being monitored. No one, no one knows what's going on there. And malware has been installed. There's bots that are running from it, and a whole bunch of things that are really nasty. And one day, um, whether it's an examiner or a customer or another bank or law enforcement calls the bank and says, hey, you have a server that's spewing malware all over the place. You really need to shut it down. I'm like, what are you talking about? We, you know, we get examined twice a year. We're doing everything right. And they never knew about the server that was really out of band. So the downside of the cloud, the good side is if you do it right, it's really going to work well for you. So how many people here have heard me present before? OK. OK. You will have seen the next few slides. If you've seen me present, and you know what they are now, because I always say, for the past 20 years, any presentation I make always has these two slides in them. The first one talks about risk management. 
I bring this up because as you look at everything you watch, you know, send information back and forth to your phone and have things transmitted somewhere, you may or may not be comfortable with having Fitbit have information about your sleeping habits, uh, as an example. It, it's up to you. You you know, let's just say those are two things you want. So you're going to look at those two and say, what's the value of the data? What risk am I taking? You know, what are the downsides of it? And is this worth doing or not? So if you were to look at risk as represented by that triangle, although I like to look at it in three dimensions, which is really difficult to do in a slide, right? But picture that if you will. That represents risk, all right? You first define your risk appetite. That says, here's how much risk I'm willing to accept before it's more than I want. Uh, by the way, that circle is the most difficult part of risk management anywhere. You can ask anyone that does any risk management exercise, uh, identifying the risk, threats, everything else is relatively easy. Knowing what your risk appetite isn't, because a lot of companies say, oh, we're, risk we're risk averse. What does that mean? We don't like to take risks. Okay, so can you come up with a risk assessment for everything you've been doing? No, because we're risk averse. Oh, so you don't like talking about risk. It doesn't mean you don't like taking risks. And then there's the we're leading edge, you know, we're really, we're out there, we like to take risks. You know how much those are. So define your risk appetite. I'm not gonna, that's a completely separate exercise and presentation that some of you have heard. And once you define your risk appetite, you recognize that there are three different vectors um, pushing on that risk. One is threats. In other words, what, what actors and activities are pushing that risk to get it outside the risk acceptance circle. There's vulnerabilities. What opportunities have I allowed to happen to let that threat exercise itself against the risk and move it outside the risk um, appetite circle? And then what's the impact? What happens when that risk is real? When that risk is realized, it's tough to say. And how much will it either cost me in losses, reputation, um, intellectual property, competitive advantage, national security, whatever it's going to be, that's what the impact is. All right. So you have all those three vectors along with the probability of of that risk actually being recognized. I consider that a pretty straightforward view of how to do risk management, knowing that the most difficult part is determining your risk appetite circle. If you look at all those in there, as long as what you're doing keeps the risk within that circle, you're doing it right. If you were to look at each one of the three sides, and I'll stop with this one after, I'll stop with this um, slide after this. If you were to look at, say, threat to be the measurement of the length of that, of side A of that triangle, what's the best way to reduce your risk? And, and let me make it easier. Let's say side B, the vulnerability side of that triangle. Vulnerability is measured by the length of that side, okay? What's the best way to reduce your risk? You have to harden yourself. You have to harden yourself, okay? I, I'm not sure I know what that is, and I don't even want to be that specific. That's no, that's not where I'm going with that. Modify the other. Modify the other. You're getting to the right point, because the risk ends up being the area inside the triangle. So if the risk is the area inside the triangle, now how many people remember geometry from high school, right? If, oh, thank you, Grayson. What, were you in it this morning? No, no. <laughs> um, well, you raise your hand, you open yourself up for that. Okay. So if you can get one of those sides down to approaching zero, then the area of the risk approaches zero, and you essentially, maybe not eliminate, but reduce your risk to a very manageable level, which means that even if it kind of edges outside the risk appetite, it won't be very much. It's going to be a sliver. All right? So th to me, the best way to look at risk management. And this slide, if you've seen me present before, you know as well. It's um, cost versus loss, but also known as the tree of FUD slide. This is you or your customer out on a limb on the tree of FUD, which stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. All right? And, and, and you have all these, sorry, the, the closer ears, Omar. You have security vendors, I'm one too, selling you FUD saying you need to buy this security control product and you need to get all the extra features. You need to cl close down every port and every service and you can't like, you can't trust anyone. You need to close everything down, right? Right. That means that's exactly what you do, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. So developer evangelist, that's what, uh, technology evangelist, that's what I do. Yes. Use nothing and you're always safe. Exactly. Yes. So that means what you're saying is take the level of controls available to you and move it as far over to the right on that graph as you possibly could. 
By doing that, if you look at the value, which is the y-axis, that's, in this case, dollars, say, for the U.S. The potential impact of that risk being realized drops significantly as you increase the level of controls. This makes sense, right? Which is why security software and, and tool people like to say, buy everything you can and turn on every control and you're going to be a lot more secure. Well, you do reduce your risk of potential impact. Of course, you also reduce the risk for revenue, depending on what you do if you're in the business. Because for every control you put in, the cost of those controls rises exponentially. Because you put in one control and you test it and make sure it works and nothing, you do regression testing, nothing bad happens, that's good. Then you put in the second control and you do all the same sort of tests, but then you have to see, does it conflict with the first control? And then you put in the third one and you have to do all the same thing, then see, does it conflict with the first and second controls? And you can see why those, those costs just spiral up. So you're always going to want to, and Charles gave the right answer to this today, you're always going to, that was a perfect answer. You didn't, you didn't arrange that with Dixie, did you? What's that? You didn't arrange that with Dixie. I did not. Okay, mm -hmm. but it was the perfect answer. I did today at the symposium, Don Dixon was, was a keynote speaker, and he asked the question, how much security do you need? It was that, I think, yeah. let me paraphrase him, but that's pretty much the question. And Charles perfectly answered just enough, which is the right answer, which is really what good business sense means. You never want to spend more on controls than you would have lost if you didn't control it. But you have to take a look at the full value. There's the actual hard dollar value, there is reputation, there are security issues, there are a whole bunch of things that come into play, but if you can say, here's the value of what I'm going to protect, I should never spend more than that to protect it, ever. Right? So two things to keep in mind. Apply them to the Internet of Things, because I then ask this question and ask you for some input on the answer. Is the Internet of Things safe? What do you think? Generally, Generally yes. I heard a bunch of mumbles over here. Yeah, oh, yeah, so you're actually mumbling. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it puts you a lot more at risk. It puts you a lot more at risk as opposed to not using it? No, I'm just saying when you're just one that's disconnected. So the fact that you're disconnected is what you get. Okay, so, so you're out there on the tree of FUD? Now he's like, why did you ask me this question, right? Okay, no, so you're saying it puts your life at risk. All right, that's good. I, and I'll accept that, yes. Are you an attorney? Uh, if for those of you on uh, LifeStream that didn't hear it, his answer was essentially it depends. So well, everything's going to be on it eventually. Yes, and everything is if it's not already. Okay, you're gonna re you want to redo your answer now, Charlie? Um, so for, for me, I think one of the things that I got at a conference today is they were talking about you know, who's actually targeted. And is it safe? Well, are you a, are you a target? Are you the city of San Antonio that has a military SA DOD presence, or are you the you know city of Burnett that doesn't have that big of a presence or that big of a footprint? So you know you could you could is it safe? No, but are you really going to be like a primary target, or are you going to be more of a target of Okay, now before, okay, and then before I, I, I hear yours, I want to repeat it because people like to me may not be hearing the question. If I can paraphrase, it, a lot of it depends on what sort of target you are. And if you look at cities, San Antonio with the big DOD and federal government presence and up being a large city is um, probably a pretty good target. Whereas the city of Burnett, which is, what, about 80 miles north of here, um, is pr probably less of a target in the big scheme of things. So that makes sense. Relatively speaking, are you a bigger target? By the way, being a dig bigger target doesn't make you a better target. In fact, so, where it, someone here can tell me this, and I really want to get your question. Where is most of the financial services, where are most of the financial services attacks occurring right now? Texas? No, no I'm not going to say within Texas. Across the industry. In what in what in what level are most financial services attacks occurring right now? More than others. The very bottom. Then there's credit card point of sale transactions. Yeah, point of sale and small to medium banks. <coughs> right? The large banks, even though they're still under attack, for the most part, they've become a, a lot better defended for a whole bunch of reasons. And they have bigger they have bigger armies defending them. So if someone wants to go after money, 
they may want to go after three mid-sized banks rather than one large one, and maybe even get more. So um, bigger target doesn't mean you're a better target all the time. If three years from today, San Antonio boasted that we are the first secure city in the US. <laughs> oh, come on, don't laugh. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> supposed to be a joke. But <laughs> Yeah, it may be a target, but you know something? If someone isn't isn't very sophisticated, they may think Austin's a better target than San Antonio because San Antonio's saying we're actually more secure. By definition, that might make Austin less secure. You don't know that, but it is certainly a possibility. So bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Um, I know you have one comment, and I want to get to the next poll. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you. Uh, um, <laughs> when you say big, doesn't that sort of depend on the person's risk appetite? So. Ooh. Boy, what an answer. You were paying attention. Thank you very much. Because <laughs> the question was, you, if when you ask, is it safe, doesn't that depend on someone's risk appetite? Absolutely it does, which is why my answer is, of course it's safe. And as long as you know the value of what you allow into the Internet of Things. So that is the perfect answer. If you've done, if you have defined your risk appetite, which most people have, and you identify the um, threats, vulnerabilities, and impact and probability, and you say this number makes sense to me, then it's perfectly safe. Um, that's a minority, but it is true. And that is the right answer. And of course, determine what, if any, controls exist and what you might need. And then you need to follow that up with have fun and don't crash your car. So that, that it ends, other than my contact information, which I'll leave up here. That ends the formal part of the presentation. We have a few minutes left if you want to have any questions, or if there are any. I mean, you participate well, and I appreciate that. Everyone seems to still be awake, so that's good. Yes? Jeff, it just seems like a lot of these things, you know, we talk about the watches and all these other, they're not built with security in mind. I mean, security is not really their main thing. Their main mm -hmm. thing is providing a service. So when I think of maybe like SCADA or something, you know, it was for the efficiency kind of national you know, the ability to control things, but there wasn't really a good security factor. Oh, no, you're right on. I'm going to repeat it again for those that are live streaming. Um, the, the, the question was, you know, watches and smart watches and all that weren't necessarily built with security in mind. Um, they're built to work, you know, to deliver a certain service or product and didn't necessarily keep security in mind. And then you jumped right into, like, SCADA devices, which, by the way, was the first big scale implementation of the Internet of Things, which unfortunately played out exactly what you just said. SCADA devices were made to locally control a piece of a machinery or equipment, and then the decision was made, rather than have engineers drive out to every device is, let's put it on the internet and make it much easier so they can control it from home, along with a third of the rest of the world. Um, and and it, to this day, there's still a whole bunch of controls that need to be in place for SCADA that aren't there yet. So, you know, industrial control systems, in fact, I think there's a conference on ICS next week, which is not unusual. I think there's one at least once a month. Um, yeah, that is definitely the Internet of Things. Most Internet of Things devices were originally not designed with security in mind. These weren't designed with security in mind. But th they are a pretty integral part of what's there now. At least they display, here's why it's important to us, because they know, based on what we've seen in the public, you're not going to buy a phone if you don't have some level of assurance that there's some security there. Right? So, yeah, exactly on. But I think also another fundamental piece of that, as, as we were talking about, the internet wasn't built with security in mind. Uh, a lot of services that we use on the internet were not built with security in mind. And with the way that businesses are uh, focusing their production in this sort of an inter iterative process, like if you're a startup, your focus is to get MVP. You know, you just want that one thing to work that one way so you can show it off and be able to receive revenue or get investors and whatnot. You can iterate after the fact. Uh, last time we had someone here, uh, she spoke about her startup, uh, Good Looking at or Glow. And that was an app that basically shares a person's location. So if they go out to party, uh, they have like five other friends that know where that person is. And if they uh, go out of like a certain safe zone, they're notified. And so it, it's, it's meant to keep that person safe but that person's uh, that uh, market, they all want to know: is this safe? You know, what sort of security protocols or what sort of uh, administrative controls do you have 
to prevent somebody from knowing where a particular person is. So if a person is partying and a, a malicious actor wants to take advantage of the fact that this person may be inebriated at some point in the evening, they know exactly how to get to that person. So how do you prevent that? And you know, she said, I don't know. I'm not a security person. I just have this app. So you know, I invite her to come over here to kind of talk about it and, and be vetted by the community here. But it, it's, it echoes the same principle. It, it wasn't built with security in mind. It was built to get that out there. And over time, it would iterate. So fundamentally, even the internet wasn't built with security mm -hmm. in mind. Nothing ever is. But there is a movement in, in the business community to, as we've seen at SAIT in the symposium, is that security is supposed to be baked in to applications. Not, not added on. And by yeah. the way, I heard party at Omar's house. Is it, no? No. Is that what I, you said? It, no. It's, it's, it's at Chris's house. Oh, okay. It's historical. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, so <laughs> historically, most people that build things don't think of, I'm going to build this in a secure way. But that is changing. More and more companies are now developing a secure development methodology where it is built into what they do. And you're going to still need some add-ons, but having it inherent to what's being built is important. And it also demonstrates that the people that know most about security are the people that build the systems, not the security experts. The people that build the systems know more about this, how that's going to be secure than the security experts. So I'm, we're, that transition is coming, and I'm glad we're getting there. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I'm new to all this. I just found out the cloud is actually hardware somewhere. I thought it was some magical space. Okay. Uh, everyone knows the names Rackspace, Amazon. We know your major providers. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows about your departments. We'll always try to cut the corners. Is there anything like any integrity checks that prevents me from stepping up to the J bot in my garage with a bunch of disks? throwing a website on the internet and trying to snag traffic for a year before, you know, my reputation shot and then just changing my location. Okay, thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase the whole thing. You started off with being surprised that the cloud actually required hardware in order to run. Yeah, and then, Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, and, and then the follow-up question was that, you know, you have all the known cloud providers, you know, the, the, the usual suspects, AWS, Microsoft, Google, um, and Rackspace and you know uh, others, and then you get to the if I had Steve's cloud and I put a few servers with some storage and some fiber into my garage, how could I run that for a year before my reputation was completely destroyed? And could I make some money selling cloud? Is, is that a good paraphrase of your? Yeah, bid? I suppose it's not safe for data, you know, but smaller companies as they're switching. Oh, if around, you're telling me it's not safe, I probably won't. You just well, don't have to tell well, me. Well, no, that. I wouldn't tell you that. <laughs> yes. but, you know, I'll sell it off as safe and encrypted, you know. Yeah, you will lie on the I'll contract up, up and down. Yeah, you're, you're perfect for the hosting environment. Targeting. <laughs> you should go into the hosting community. No, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So the short answer is, of course you could do that. If you, anyone that sets up business on the cloud and is willing to say, I will sell you this and it's going to cost you less than if you go over there, you will get customers. And at some point, your reputation may take a hit. Yes. So following up on that, there's actually an article on Cranbox Security uh, posted uh, on the 28th of last month where one of the a, a service that had been identified as potentially malicious by a lot of the big security firms had shut down. And then a new service run by the same people, like in a house a couple of blocks over, all of a sudden cropped up. And uh, one of the interesting things was they dimed them out uh, on the blog, and then they got threatened with a lawsuit from like somebody in Iran uh, or Dubai. I think it was Dubai. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't happen. Yeah, it actually does. And they found very recent case studies. Yes. So that. I won't communicate all that back here, but I, I'm going to summarize it with: go look at Krebs on security and the posting he had. What was the date in August? 28th of August. August, 28th of August, and you can see an example of that very issue we were just talking about. Thank you, Charlie. Anything else? Because we're getting pretty close to time. Right? Yeah, another, another add-on to that point, uh, not to, to push the belabor the point, uh, at the symposium today, they did have a talk specifically about that. And there was a lawyer and there was a technologist on stage that were discussing that. And the lawyer, of course, talked about service uh, level uh, agreements. Uh, mm -hmm. And if 
you're going to negotiate with the provider to have your your applications, your storage, to a, a cloud service provider, a CSP, you're going to have to get in those conversations. Like, you know, what happens if you go down? How quickly will you let me know that you're down? How quickly will you resolve that? You know, what are sort of the questions that you should ask? So if you're like a mom and pop shop, you're not going to know that. If you're the enterprise, you're going to have a lawyer make up that agreement and talk to them. If you're somewhere in the middle, then it's going to vary. You know, so very much uh, predatory cloud service providers could you know, say, we're super cheap, but you get nothing from us. Whereas, you know, you have a much larger provider or even smaller providers say like, hey, we will do all this stuff for you, but it's going to cost you this much. So to what Omar just said, as much as that could still happen now, that's how the industry started. So I was at Rackspace during the IPO. I've also worked at Layer Tech and um, Interland, Engine Yard, and Checktree, who are all different service providers. But I can tell you, up until recently, I was involved in a lot of those contract negotiations, and we would do everything we can to get away from anything that talked about giving us any liability for anything that happened in your data. We just wanted you to pay for us to do it. And that was it. And, and it doesn't mean everyone, anyone's evil. It's how, the, it's how the industry started, and it's grown and matured since then. So, good, good question, Steve. Yeah, Thanks. great question. We're down to like two minutes. So do, I'm you wanna, do, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really almost ran out of time. Something else that we wanted to do today that I wanted to start, and the, I know at least one other person, but one is here, but one other person that said they want to do this, I'm guessing couldn't make it. Um, there is an organization called the Security Leaders Forum. There's a few of us that are members of that in here. I'm not trying to open that, but we're not an open organization. We're not formal. We meet um, periodically every month. And um, there, there's nothing other than a bunch of security organization or thought leaders, and even then not a very big bunch, that get together usually over lunch and talk about either here's the problems I'm facing, and we get together and say, hey, here's how I solve that, or it's, um, you know, here's what I'm doing well, and someone else can say, I like that idea, and, and, and we just commiserate that way. Um, I've posed a question to them, and I know there's at least one person that, and I'm not going to say you're volunteering, but you're here that I, when I pose a question to them, and I think we're going to get more over time, is since a lot of people in the dojo are trying to get their career going in security, <laughs> and a lot of us in Security Leaders Forum have a career that's at least at altitude, if not potentially about to leave orbit of <laughs> insecurity, uh, that maybe there's an opportunity for some of us to provide some level of mentorship for those of us that are trying to get into it just to help. It doesn't mean that we keep any relationship other than let's see if we can help each other. And I've mentored a number of people. And I will say, in a, from a greedy perspective, me mentoring people, I get more out of it than, than the people being mentored. That doesn't mean I'm a terrible mentor. I, I, I don't think it does. But I, I, so if you are senior level in any way and you're not sure about whether you want to do this, it is, a, it is a great experience and you do get a lot of it. And the people being mentored obviously get a lot as well. Whether it's something as simple as you know, complaining that you're not getting budget, there's good ways to help address that. Or, you know, I want to be a CISO one day, so how many certifications do I need? Which is like, okay, wait a minute. Let, let, let's get back the conversation up one. Certifications doesn't equal CISO all the time. So, you, you know, you come up with guidance to see how's it going to work. So if anyone here, is, is anyone here willing to stand up to be a mentor right now? Because I am. I, uh, thank <laughs> you, Charles. And you we can have be a mentor, Grayson. Really? Yeah. I can be a mentor. There's no reason. You don't have to be old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just need to have a good set of experience you're going to be able to share. So I would say just spend a few minutes, there's four of us so far, I think I saw four. Let's just spend a few minutes, at least five, was that? I have questions for you afterwards. Oh, okay. And if you're interested in uh, being mentored, I would offer, because what I don't want to say is necessarily have a whole bunch of people raise your hand and where we're going to, let's find a way to get that either in Slack or something where we can say, let, in fact, let's set up a new channel for mentoring that talks about getting the mentors and mentees together and seeing what we can do to match it up. And I think it's, it helps the mission of the dojo without question, and it really is going to help the mentors as well. So thanks. Thanks to the other three that have volunteered. I know we're going to get more. Thanks for reminding me of that, too. Sure. So you had a question, and it, it, it's eight o'clock. So for those that want to leave at eight, uh, not that you need permission, but it, you know that's fine. But I'm I'm going to stay a bit, and you're welcome as well. You had a question. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you, oh, you, you want this an off off, off the line, air off question? The stream? Thank you very much for tuning in today. Yeah. <laughs>
We are right now forward. leading. Quickly, before we do break, uh, I do want to ask you all, what are some of the strangest and funniest IoT devices you've heard of? Yeah, this was going to be in my presentation, oh and I and I ended up not doing it, and I apologize for that. I, I had, just so you know, today I had one in mind that I thought was the most ridiculous IoT device ever, and in the session this afternoon, someone came up with an example that blew mine away. All right, get a couple of ridiculous examples of IoT. Come on. I'm not saying that loud. He doesn't want to say sex toy. Okay, that, that wins. That was it. That, that, was it. that wins. <laughs> sex toy. So I had toilet up to now, all right? Yeah. Which I thought was a pretty ridiculous oh, IoT well, device. Like so I'm, I'm at, today in today's session, in, in, in today's session, I'm not going to ask how you know about it, right. but in today's session, I said, so give me a ridiculous thing. And, and I was going with a toilet is the answer, right? And then there was like, you know, someone said toaster, and then, you know, some of the usual things. And then in the back, someone said, you toy. And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. And he said, sex toy. And I said, you win. And <laughs> <laughs> so I went over to him, and he described what it does, how it works. And, and, and what in graphic so I, detail. So I, had to ask, I had to ask, was it good for you? And then I had to point out the fact that he had a bottle of hand sanitizer right there. So this whole thing is not going where he wanted to. <laughs> yeah, that wins. Uh, you win a free IoT sex story. <laughs> and bragging rights. Uh, yeah, I'm putting the stream off now. Okay.